Governor Pritzker gets big agenda items passed and signs a budget. We'll talk about it next on Capitol View. Welcome to Capital View, the program where we talk about state issues, sometimes federal issues, and how they just might affect your life. I'm Bernie Schoenberg from the State Journal Register. The legislature has gone home for a while, but not before doing a lot of stuff that Governor Pritzker liked. And here to talk about that with me, uh, we are lucky to have Charlie Wheeler is back. He is director of the Public Affairs Reporting Program, University of Illinois Springfield, for a little while yet. Uh, longtime Chicago Sun-Times reporter before that, and a state budget expert. So, Charlie, welcome back. Thank you. It's always fun to be here. <laughs> Thank you. And Rebecca Anzell is here. She is one of the crack reporting team with the kind of new Capital News Illinois. Rebecca, <laughs> thanks for being here again. Yes, thank you. Okay. Charlie, you have been watching, if I understand it, legislative sessions for about 50 years. <laughs> How do you rate this one when you take a look at a new governor who came in and said, I want to do certain things. Yeah, I would rate this pretty high in terms of getting things done. I think if you look at it, it may have been the most transformative session since back in uh, 19, 1969 legislative session, Richard Ogilvie's first session as governor, when we enacted an income tax, we totally re re rearranged how state budgeting is done we made a lot of important changes. I think this would rate right up here in terms of uh, the governor getting through both the constitutional amendment to go before the voters to allow a graduated income tax. Which they will vote on next November, next so November, we're going to have a big yeah. fight between now and then, but yeah, at least the legislature passed that it. The legislature doesn't change its mind at some point. There's the Constitution provides that if they want, they have until next May to change their mind and pull it back. Now, that's not going to happen, I don't imagine. But there are a lot of major things which we'll be talking about here. And, sure. it, and it made me think, in a way, it's kind of like it was back in the olden days, in the sense that there was a legislative majorities that worked with the governor. The governor took into account some of the things that the minorities wanted, and a lot of the stuff was bipartisan. And we've gone through virtually the whole 21st century when we've had governors who, in my judgment, were not up to the job. We had one who was anti-union and spent four years trying to destroy the state, in my opinion. <laughs> we had you another didn't like guy, Governor Rauner's style. Oh, no, or, I didn't. Or policy, let's say. No, I, I don't agree with his policies, and I think you, you he, he misjudged the politics. If you're in the minority and you have not enough votes and the legislature do 60-30, there's not much you can do. You can either work with them and figure out how to get what you can, or you can just bang at them and wind up getting nothing done. And then we had Blagojevich, who was just a total, I have to think of a word that's acceptable to say, but who's not a very good governor, put it that way. Thank you for remembering this is a family television <laughs> station. <laughs> so yeah, I, I think, that, as I say, this is what it was like back in the days when we had Thompson, when we had Edgar, even George Ryan got stuff done. Okay, uh, Rebecca, and I, I will definitely be letting Charlie talk some about the budget, but you did have, uh, at least on, on budgeting and a capital plan. So we passed a budget of about, what, $40 billion in operating funds, and we passed a, a plan for capital improvements that will raise some taxes uh, and fees um, and create a six-year plan with $45 billion in building. And there was bipartisan support on some of this. Uh, yeah. And, and um, any particular um, um, uh, highlights of um, the budget? Charlie, let's go with you on that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think one of the significant things is it does appear to be balanced. Now, it's not going to be balanced in the sense that all of our past debt is going to be paid off. We'll still owe hundreds of billions of dollars for the pensions. We'll still wind up with a, a deficit in the sense that the money that we bring in in fiscal 20 will not be enough, enough to cover what didn't get paid from fiscal 19 plus what's in fiscal 20, but the deficit will go down, which means that we will have spent less in FY20 than the money that came in in FY20. In my mind, that's a balanced budget. We've also attended to the terrible infrastructure problems that we're facing with this 41, 41 and a half, whatever it is, billion capital plan over six years 
to do a whole lot that's really needed. Anybody who's driven on our roads knows how bad that is. And so I think that's a very positive thing that's in the budget. We also provided increases for, for example, the Department of Children and Family Services, which is an agency that's been under great stress. Uh, in my mind, it's the most difficult job in the world because you make decisions and little kids' lives are at stake. It's not like if you're gonna fill a pothole or not, you know, maybe somebody gets a flat tire. Little kids' lives are at stake. We put a lot of money in to allow DCFS to increase their numbers of caseworkers on the line folk and for more training, and that's gonna be good. And, and all throughout the human services, there's money in there to, to take care of the, some of the, in my judgment, some of the sins of the Rauner administration. Yeah, um, we did hear uh, Republicans on board for many things, but there was also something that uh, allowed like every Republican in the Senate to vote against uh, the main budget, and that's because a cost of living increase for legislators that the legislature has rejected aggressively, or, or they have to like pass legislation to reject it every yeah. year, um, was included in legislation that the Senate passed, but the House did not, so they're gonna get on top of their 67,000 something base pay, and then most of them get some more in stipends for doing committee work or leadership, but they're gonna get about a $1,600 pay raise and Republicans were certainly upset with that. Yeah, so Republicans weren't thrilled about it. Um, the Senate tried to get through the measure that would prevent that pay increase to go through and the House sort of passed it to a sponsor who then sort of tabled that and so the increase went through. Um, reporters asked Governor Pritzker, you know, what did you think about this? You know, you are raising taxes on people. Um, how can you justify this pay increase for, for lawmakers? And Governor Pritzker basically said, well, lawmakers did a lot this, this session. Um, they worked really hard. They stayed really late. We had an extended session. They deserve it. Um, and reporters have asked Governor Pritzker this both at a press conference he had the day session ended on Sunday. The we jokingly called it May 33rd. Um, <laughs> and it was and actually, then what, June, June 2nd. 2nd, <laughs> right. Uh, and then again in Chicago, he was at an event to discuss the census and the importance of the state throwing in money for the uh, upcoming census. Um, and he said much the same thing, that lawmakers deserved it. Right, but which is funny because and it, this is not a fair representation other than to say on uh, uh, online social media stuff, you, you get what you get and there's a lot of people who are upset about everything. But I watched uh, a fa Facebook Live when the governor ended up signing the budget bill in Chicago with a bunch of legislators and other advocates uh, behind and around him. And there are scrolling comments and all of them were like, you know, who are these bad people who got a pay raise? They should all be fired. We're all leaving Illinois. Charlie, uh, I guess uh, this is what you get from, I guess, commenters on social media and yet, um, Arguably, there are many people who are happy about the budget because of the building programs. Well, that, you know, that's the capital side. Uh, uh, and the fact that the state government will be more adequately funded, that people actually kind of agree this is balanced. Well, you know, even though there is continuing debt, as yeah, you talked about. And I think it's, it's not really fair to criticize Rauner for the fact that... Uh, you mean Rauner, Pritzker, Pritzker, yes. Duh. Yeah. <laughs> to, to criticize Pritzker for the fact that there is a cost of living adjustment that's gonna go through. And the reason is that the way the law is structured now, the cost of living is automatic unless legislatures says, no, we don't want it for this fiscal year. Right. And for the last several fiscal years, they've added a section to the law saying in this fiscal year, we don't get the COLA, nor do the executive officers, nor do the heads of departments. But it was not added to the major, like 3,000 page budget implementation bill. And so they had a, a side bill to try and do it. Which they did at the last minute they of the did Senate floor. The last minute. The, President the Senate Cullerton actually it. went over to the and, Republican and the side and said, I'll find you a bill, it looked like. Yeah. And they did oh, yeah. find him a bill, but then they the House didn't the act house, on it. The House did not act on it. The person who took over the sponsorship uh, filed a motion to non-concur, to not agree with the Senate amendment. And so that bill was in limbo. Presumably they could come back and do it in a veto session. So there is roughly a million dollars in the budget, in the comptroller's budget to pay cost of living adjustments for all the people who are covered by this. And the governor could veto that out, I suppose, using a line item veto from the budget. But the courts have said, and it's never reached the level of Supreme Court, but a, a couple of circuit court decisions uh, working against Pat Quinn when he tried to veto salaries to get 
lawmakers to do something with pensions. Yeah, like if you don't pass the budget yeah, or, and, or do and something, you won't get paid for a while. Former Comptroller Leslie Bunker, when she tried to uh, hold up legislative salaries, and so the the court precedent as it stands, and as I say, it's not made it up to the top court, but it is the legislators are supposed to get paid, it doesn't matter. And so were the governor to try and block it, he would have to use an amendatory veto. He'd have to rewrite that section of the law that makes it automatic. For him to do that, he'd have to have a bill, not a budget bill, but a substantive bill that he could use. And then that would not become operative until the legislature reacted to the amendatory veto. So if you were to use the main substantive budget bill, all that stuff, the increases for providers, all the kind of stuff that's very important to make the budget work would have been stalled in limbo uh, until the fall, or unless the governor called him back in a special session, which I would say is probably not a good idea. Yes. Yeah, and uh, interestingly, uh, this is the first raise that legislators are allowing themselves, as it turns out, even though some of them didn't want them to allow themselves, <laughs> in 10 years. Um, you know, and again, on s it's like less than 3%, it's two something percent, I think. Um, so y you can be mad at them and say they all do nothing, or you can be like the governor and note, as many of us who work with them note, how s hard many of them work, uh, certainly the ones in charge of the major bills, but it is what it is, and I know there are people out there who love to hate their politicians, so <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we will see where that goes. Uh, one other thing that people clearly notice, uh, is that for this capital plan, uh, uh, the first big building plan that the state has passed in 10 years, partly because um, like the Democratic legislature did not trust either Blagojevich, uh, and then they did one under Pat Quinn, but they didn't trust Rauner to do it. You have to have kind of trust that if well, yeah. you give a lot of bonding <coughs> authority and money to a governor, that that governor will spend it in ways that are legitimate, that might help you. Many legislators have their own projects in yeah, this. Or, or to put it more, what would you say, more crassly, that if I vote for this gas tax increase, I can tell my constituents, yeah, you're going to pay more at the pump, but on the other hand, that road that's turned into oatmeal, it's going to be asphalt <laughs> again. Right. And I have to be able to rely on the governor to do that. Because on all these appropriation bills for projects, there's like a last paragraph at the bottom of the bill that says these funds have to be released by the governor for any of these projects. Mm -hmm. And if you don't trust the governor, you're not going to go out on a limb. Right. And among the charges, they're going to pay more for like driver's licenses and, and car licenses and 19 cents a gallon gas tax that's been in force since I think uh, 1990. Uh, is being doubled to 38 cents. So uh, even some Republicans did vote for this. Yeah, um, Representative Margot McDermott stood up and she had said on the floor, you know, I have never voted my entire career. I did not fact check this. I do not know this to be independently right. true. But she said that she um, has never voted for a tax increase in her entire political career in the state house. Um, but she would vote for that that increase, those increases in taxes, because the capital plan was that important. Um, funding for horizontal infrastructure improvements, roads, and bridges, roads, bridges mm -hmm. et cetera, um, yeah, and she's, were that important to I the think state. I, I think it's believable that she's quite a conservative person. She <laughs> is, know, yeah. She, she is a, a strong member of a, a conservative part <laughs> of the re Republican Party and is not shy about that. But <laughs> right. but everybody knows that there's going to be a lot of projects here. Um, there's also a cigarette tax increase as part of it. I think a dollar a pack. Is yeah, that, right? that what's interesting about that is the governor um, had initially proposed 32 cents. Um, President Cullerton, who is no fan of the tobacco industry, immediately said, N no, we're going to do a dollar right. that's backed by research from advocates. Um, the members of the House on the Democratic side had said, we don't want a dollar, we want 32 cents. There was some back and forth for a while. They were going to do a different sort of tax, and I will spare you the details, but when it showed up in the Capitol plan, a couple people were surprised that that was in there. Um, and then they snuck in, at the last second, um, a change in definitions to include electronic cigarettes um, as well, vaping, so yeah. electronic cigars, hookahs, um, which have never been regulated by the state. So there's an, uh, it's a tax on them, it's 15% of wholesale. Uh, nobody knows what the revenue bring in is gonna be on that because like, they've never been regulated. So it's mm -hmm. a big win for, for the Senate president. Right. And John Cullerton, I, I, think, uh, I think he was still in the House. Wasn't he the sponsor, Charlie, of uh, 
um, uh, like a seatbelt law yeah. for cars. So he's always been for this <coughs> public safety stuff yeah. and has, has gotten it through. Uh, of course, he's also tried motorcycle helmet law in Illinois, but uh, <laughs> the motorcycle lobby, uh, ABATE, a brotherhood aimed toward education, is just too politically strong in this state. People yeah. like their motorcycles and they like the freedom of just to have to wear glasses, not, not, a, uh, not a helmet in Illinois, and that's still the law. But anyway, um, Charlie, you, uh, before the, we started taping, you mentioned uh, it was interesting that there are some pro-business uh, aspects to the, the budget that was passed by the governor, some tax credits for things like data centers, for purchasing of manufacturing equipment. Um, and I know that very late in the legislative session, and I think it was uh, Friday night, May 31st, when they were trying to figure this all out, uh, there were meetings in the governor's office. I ended up standing outside the governor's office for a while. I know Jim Durkin, uh, mm -hmm. the House Republican leader, went in and talked with the governor for a while. Uh, I, we saw the governor walking back and forth between some offices. He was actively engaged. I know that within the last day or two of that planned session, he had also gone to meet with all of the uh, Republican senators in their caucus yeah. across, across the uh, rotunda from his own office. And then he had, took a back stairway to quickly go back to his office so because he wasn't really answering questions other than to say when asked how the meeting went, he held a, a thumbs up. But uh, there was some pro-business stuff uh, put into this budget, and that allowed Jim Durkin, uh, who is still very critical of some things passed by the Democrats, oh, to say, and he is the leader of uh, Republicans in the House, to say that the governor listened, we got some changes we need for business, and we're at least glad for that with our severe minority that we have uh, in the legislature. Yeah, and, and to me, again, to sound like a broken record, that to me is how it's supposed to work. You try and find common ground. And the idea of, of providing incentives to, to try and, a, a tax credit to try and attract data centers, Illinois has been kind of in the forefront of it and we've fallen behind. Our neighbors have started to out, I guess, outbid us and we have to keep up with it because we have the, the talent we have the location, and there's no reason we shouldn't do that. And to, to get away with a franchise tax, that dates back more than a century, back before we had an income tax, back before we had a sales tax. Mm -hmm. You had to get a franchise, and you had to pay a tax to run a business. So that's gonna be gone, and that's gonna be particularly helpful for smaller mom and pop type operations. And we also got some training and apprenticeship programs. So there are a lot of things, and somebody made the comment that Jim Durkin got more for the business community from in like one night from Governor Pritzker than the business community got from Bruce Rauner in four years. Yeah, I think Rich Miller might have said that in capital facts, but yeah, interesting. Um, there was another, uh, uh, oh, I just want to mention briefly, and we, we talked about the progressive income tax because there was so much talk about this, and even when he signed the budget, the governor was talking about the progressive income tax. Again, they passed rates, which Republicans don't like because they don't believe they'll stay that way. Uh, but the main thing that the legislature did this year that Governor Pritzker wanted them to do was the House and the Senate both voted on the, on the constitutional amendment, mm -hmm. which will be voted on next November. Uh, governor doesn't even have a say in this because if the legislature passes it, it goes on the ballot, as it's we automatic. talked about. Yeah. Um, and we're just going to see all of these advertisements that have started already with Think Big Illinois, which is funded by the governor and outside group to advocate. And there are the business groups that are... Um, uh, advertising already saying that don't believe the Democrats who run the state to keep the rates low and don't believe that only 3% uh, at the top of the ladder are going to pay more because everybody will end up paying more because they won't get enough money or people will leave the state even though other people say they won't. So it's just going to be a big yeah, issue. It, it, uh, it, but I, for now, the state will operate on its operating budget that just passed and, and this is just going to hang out there Without taking into account any revenue from changing the tax rates. Right. And I'm thinking to myself, this is going to be such a windfall if, if I'm the, the sales director for a commercial radio station or TV station, right. <laughs> or from well, social media presence, I'm just salivating well, at how much happen. money. <laughs> yeah. uh, Rebecca, there was another issue this session. Uh, and again, we have an overwhelmingly Democratic legislature and a Democratic governor who is very pro-choice on the issue of abortion. And it looked like after an initial flurry of activity uh, in the state saying we want to put it, you know, change our abortion laws to get rid of the old stuff that uh, had too many requirements, uh, blocking potential uh, abortions. Uh, and then it kind of got tucked away in committee, but then some other states, including some in the South and Missouri, uh, legislatures that are run by Republicans mostly, uh, were 
uh, passing very restrictive abortion laws that could test Roe versus Wade and see if abortion will continue to be legal nationwide or not. And then uh, Illinois ended up uh, in very emotional debates in both the House and Senate passing uh, very more liberalized abortion law, or as the, the folks who are, in, that's what the opponents say, uh, whereas the advocates were saying, we're just putting into law what currently exists under court orders, et cetera. But Illinois really went the more liberal route on abortion this year. Yeah, um, I feel like every story, so I've been covering the Reproductive Health Act since uh, advocates announced in early February that they were going to file legislation. And I, every story that I have written since, I mentioned that both opponents and proponents um, agree that the legislation, if and when Governor Pritzker w uh, signs it, um, will be the most liberal reproductive health care statute in the country. Um, when New York signed its law, everybody focused on them in both celebration or not, depending which side of the debate you were on. Um, Illinois is, is arguably more liberal than that. Um, you, yeah, uh, we'll see. I think one thing to note, um, everybody focuses on the abortion part of it just because of, that's the most contentious mm -hmm. part of it, I guess. The language in the bill is gender neutral, um, and it wasn't designed that way to allow men access to reproductive health care, although that's what it does, but it was also designed that way for, um, because gender is so fluid in today's society, uh, for people who have female reproductive organs um, that don't identify as a woman mm -hmm. to have access to reproductive health care. Um, but I mean, one thing that I think you're seeing now, there's a, a clinic in what your former colleague, Crystal Thomas, who's now in Kansas City, wrote about this. Um, there's a clinic in Granite City, and half of its clientele, it's called the Hope Clinic, half of its clientele comes up from Missouri. Um, mm -hmm. So I think one of the things that you're seeing, there's a, it, it's probably going to be an influx of Right, and, and what's interesting is I, I listened to the Senate debate on this, and there was a debate. Yeah. Well, you're going to have more people coming from other states, and we'll make Illinois the home of abortion for them. And the proponents were saying, we think that's good because it's poor women yeah. who don't have access, and if they can drive to a, across state lines and get access here that we think people should have, then then we're glad for that. So it's a, a and obviously the opponents think the you know late term abortion is the big problem, and proponents say people are not you know, making these decisions lightly. They're not having full-term babies and then just deciding to kill them because they decided today they want to kill them. So uh, very emotional debate but on it, both sides. But we should be clear that the Reproductive Health Act is not just abortion. So mm -hmm. it expands and makes easier access to things like birth control and, you know, contraception, pelvic exams, anything even under the umbrella of reproductive health care, which again includes access for men. Mm -hmm. um, to that kind of health care, yeah. too. Understood. So, Understood. Not just abortion. And we do think the governor will sign this because he's made yeah, that he pretty clear so, so far. So um, we should mention uh, in the last few minutes of the show, uh, adult use marijuana is going to be legal in Illinois. Medical marijuana is now uh, expanded, to, w if the governor signs th the bill on that, expanded to some more ailments. Uh, and made permanent. So Charlie, we're going to be a big state in the marijuana business. <laughs> yes, I guess we are. It'll be, uh, what would you say, Illinois high. <laughs> <laughs> but to me, it makes a lot of sense. I, I think the war on drugs has been kind of a failure in that it's affected disproportionately communities of color, low-income communities. It hasn't stopped people from using pot I mean, some folks very near and dear to me have used it. They never had any problem getting a hold of it. Yeah. And so it's, it's a black market out there that's been well established. It's just sort of like when we did the, uh, the video gaming, uh, those slot machines were in taverns everywhere. And if there was nobody there but regulars, you played, you win, you got a payoff. If there was somebody there nobody recognized, then they'd say, oh, good for you. Right. And, and uh, as you mentioned, uh, the, the, the governor and the sponsors of that bill really stressed the criminal justice reform, that yeah. they're going to try to clear the records of anybody who had just yeah, possession in, in of two 30 ways. grams. They're, they're going to, l lesser offenses, the convictions, the governor is going to um, use his clemency power to wipe them out. And convictions of uh, for a higher amount, but that would still be legal under the new law, as I understand it, it would be up to the person to go to the state's attorney or, or go to the, the police or the courts and ask to have the record wiped clean. Yeah. And on the other hand, there's also incentives in there to bring people of color, low-income people, 
into, into the, the business. business. Right. Yeah, and training for them. There's, I think there's a provision, is it there, that would allow community colleges yes. to provide training and how do you grow marijuana? Right. So there's, there's a lot of things to be said for it. And to me, as I say, the big thing is you're legalizing, regulating something that exists now but in the shadows. Yeah, and interestingly, I'm gonna move quickly to gambling because we're having, and they also passed, which was another big plank for the governor, uh, sports betting uh, on pro sports, plus the creation of casinos, which uh, are now gonna be authorized in Rockford, Danville, Lake County, uh, Chicago, Williamson County, uh, and the south suburbs. Um, and also, um, the bars and restaurants that have video gaming machines have five, they, they'll be able to have six, they'll be, uh, There'll be some, uh, at the beer tents at the State Fair in Springfield, they'll have some video gaming. So we're going to see a big expansion of gambling. People worry about addiction, but this is also a lot of the money for that is for the construction plan. So um, it yeah, seems it like there, wa there wasn't the argument uh, too much that, well, we, we don't want to dip our toes in gambling. We're, we're there. And, and if you think about it, um, the places that are getting the casinos, like there'll be one in Waukegan, well, I saw one of the, uh, I don't know if it was the mayor or, or somebody from Waukegan said, like every day a busload goes up to, the, up to Milwaukee to the Pottawatomie Casino to gamble. The people on the south side or in Chicago, they go across the line to Indiana and gamble. And so it's not that we're going to get people doing something they don't do anyway, but again, it's going to be regulated. It's going to be for our benefit rather than the Hoosiers or the Badgers. Well, we will hear a lot more about these things as the governor continues to sign bills. He's signed the budget, but we're going to, there, he's got a lot of things to sign. He got a lot of things done. We'll see how it goes. We'll see um, what it means politically in the future too, but we are now in the governing phase. And uh, of course, everybody will file for election by the end of the year for the next two year cycle, but we'll see. Well, that's gonna have to do it for now. Charlie Wheeler and Rebecca Anzel, thank you for the help. I'm Bernie Schoenberg, thank you for watching. Uh, and even though the legislature's out, we'll be watching all these bills get signed and things happen. So we'll see you next time on Capitol View.